We return thanks to our mother, the earth, who sustains us, to the rivers and streams that run upon the bosom of the earth, to the descending rains that give us water and cause all plants to grow. Water is part of us. Water is our culture. We, we, we pray with water. Water is everything. Without water, nothing exists. Everything around us seems to be putting the wrong things into the river. And we start thinking right then, you know, water quality, I mean, it can be long, it's going to be affecting our wells too. People has moved in in the past and poisoned our bays and left us. Well, we're not going to allow that to happen anymore. Water is life. Pa, Mape, Tu, Kwa. By any name, water represents a life force to American Indians. Rivers, lakes, streams, wetlands, and oceans are part of our landscape. Water nourishes our tribes, our herds, and our crops. And water is part of our tribal legends and rituals. Songs that we make up are always talking about water. Water coming from the sky, water coming from the clouds, and we pray for rain. Our people really uh, held the waters and natural resources sacred. We pray to have moisture. We pray to the rivers. We pray to the water holes. We pray for rain because as a human being, that's what nourishes our body is water. From the Seminoles of Florida to the Sioux of the Upper Plains to the Clinket of Alaska, countless generations of American Indians have lived with the land and respected Mother Earth and her abundant resources. No laws or regulations were needed to maintain this delicate balance. The rains and, and uh, the flushing and, and everything, nature took care of water standards. If you're talking about turn of the century, people started to gather here. All of a sudden, we have a people problem. Our lands were then affected by the industrialization of the country. Pollution flowed in our rivers, lakes, and streams. As a result, our relationship with water changed. We have our elders telling us of a time when they could drink water from the river, and nobody would dream of doing that today. I mean, Acoma used to rely on their drinking water coming out of systems up at Acoma, but now we have acid rain. Who wants to drink acid? Water remains a vital part of our lives and our culture. But the quality of our water today cannot be taken for granted. We must take action to protect it. The tribes are the stewards of the land, and, and they have a different cultural value of what we're talking about. Without the water, and without the river, and without what it brings to us spiritually, economically, just what it takes to make us whole and make us who we are, that's how important it is. Things are different. Things are not what I saw when I was growing up as a young person. Things are not just what grandfather taught me. In the 1960s, people across the country became more aware of water pollution. Fish kills were common, sewage flowed in rivers, and in 1969, Ohio's Cuyahoga River became so polluted with toxic waste, it burst into flames. The public demanded action and the U.S. Congress responded by enacting the Clean Water Act in 1972 to improve the nation's water quality. The Clean Water Act is implemented by the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, EPA. But initially, little was done to protect the water quality in Indian country. Then in 1987, Congress amended the Clean Water Act these amendments authorize EPA to provide funding for eligible tribes and to treat eligible tribes as states for the purpose of establishing their water quality standards. While EPA and tribes working together have made a lot of progress, most tribal waters still are not protected by basic standards under the Clean Water Act. It's very important that we protect our sovereignty in relation to the water issue. If we don't, someone else is going to take care of it and we'll lose jurisdiction over that and not have the control over it. 
So what are water quality standards? Water quality standards are the foundation and a tool for improving and protecting our surface waters. Water quality standards consist of three parts. One, the use or uses of a water body for such things as fishing, swimming, boating, or for cultural or traditional uses. Two, water quality criteria, which are limits on pollutants and conditions that will protect the use of the water. And three, an anti-degradation policy that governs changes in water quality. Tribes develop water quality standards to protect a range of uses. Certainly, surface waters for many tribes are a source of drinking water. They may be a source of irrigation water for fields, their economic livelihood if they're a fishing community. They may have sweat lodges, certain ceremonies that involve immersion in water for both the health of the ecosystem and the health of the tribal members. Having water quality standards is something that is critical to them. Some tribes have seen the advantages of developing their own water quality standards under the Clean Water Act and are now seeing positive results for their efforts. Here are the success stories of the Akama and Chehalis tribes. the mother water clan of our tribe. When there's a sickness of animals on the reservation of dehydration and stuff, they call the water clan people to bless the water so the animals could have some refreshing water to drink. You know, you have the Huaka clan and you have the Tzitz Hanut. Those are the two important clans that have a lot to do with water. Special prayers and songs are made and sung before the water is given to an individual or to the fields or to, to the animals. People started noticing the, the discoloration, uh, the quality of the water, uh, not only uh, in the river, but also in our farming fields. Uh, there was uh, drastic changes that took place. Someday it'll run out if we don't put a stop to it here. The Pueblo of Acoma's reservation stretches across almost 900 square miles of high desert in New Mexico. For hundreds of years, Acoma's hunted these lands and cultivated crops from the desert. While tribal members live in and around three towns on the reservation, the heart of the Pueblo is Old Acoma, a town atop a 357 foot high sandstone mesa. Old Acoma, called Sky City, is one of the oldest continuously inhabited communities in North America. The traditional name for the Pueblo of Acom is really Hago, and Hago means basically in our language uh, the place that always was, a place that always prepared, and a place that it's always going to be. Over the years, Acoma has become known throughout the world for its beautiful black and white pottery. Today, tourism, tribal government, gaming, and ranching support the Pueblo's economy. For generations, Acoma's enjoyed a steady flow of clean, clear water from the Rio San Jose and other area aquifers. But in the 1970s, tribal members and other area residents noticed pollutants and sludge accumulating on the Rio San Jose. Our farmers, as irrigators, noticed that the water was harmful to them when they stepped in it, and uh, it was very visible. Uh, you could smell the odor of those discharges in the river. All these natural springs that we have at Acoma are some places are shut because of the contamination and these things that have gone through our pueblo. Other pollutants that we have to deal with are livestock that often wander about near springs and our river and pollute them. We're having algae blooms, huge algae blooms, on the, on the lake itself, which was depleting really the oxygen for the, for the fish that we had stocked there. Uh, we had fish scales going on. It was a big, uh, not only economic blow to the tribe, but also a, 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 an agricultural blow because uh, everybody east of the lake um, uh, who, who farmed depended on that particular source of water. In addition, the nearby town of Grants had been discharging its wastewater into the river. 
Under the Clean Water Act, pollutants discharged from point sources require a National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System, or NPDES permit. Grants had such a permit from EPA to discharge treated effluent into the river. However, the city's wastewater treatment plant had numerous violations to its permit limits. This is what happened with the uh, contamination that we got from uh, the city of Grants. And uh, this is what we have to contend with on our river system is uh, years and years of black muck. And in some areas, it's anywhere from a foot to six feet deep. And it's just pure, you know, just pure muck that's going to take time. As a result, the Pueblo of Acoma eventually took legal action against Grants in the 1980s. This began the process of the tribe developing its own environmental programs. We realized we would need to manage that resource on a day-to-day -day basis and to bring in more technical capability um, here on the Pueblo. The Pueblo of Acoma ultimately wanted to improve their domestic water supply, create a fishery, have water for recreation, and bring farming back to historic levels. To do that, the tribe received technical and financial assistance from the EPA, and in 1996, they began the process of developing their own water quality standards. They are our funding source. EPA was very open to, uh, to building that relationship. We have EPA come and do presentations to even uh, our tribal government, who is the tribal council and tribal administration, and also uh, establish a good, coherent type of relationship, which we deal with community people. Which I think is important for other tribes to realize. I think uh, a lot of times throughout the country, uh, tribes um, have uh, a very different view and a dim view when it comes to federal agencies and being able to work and develop hand in hand. If we don't come together, the feds, the state, the tribes, the local governments, the people on the watersheds, if we don't work together, there won't be nothing. There won't be no clean water. There won't be no salmon. There won't be no government-to-government -government relation. There won't be no, there won't be any any uh, animals protection or or anything. It's it's just uh, we have to work together. There's no other way. We had a series of public hearings to begin the process of getting our our standards approved through EPA. The public and local governments gave the Pueblo of Acoma enthusiastic support. The Pueblo of Acoma approached this process in a very smart, efficient way, and it went smoothly. Open public forums gave everyone a chance to learn what the tribe was proposing and to give their input. Just a whole thought and idea of uh, bringing information to the attention of our people in various uh, areas and uh, accommodate those concerns and be able to assist us and work together in a good partnership. Make our our, our government stronger, make our tribe stronger, make our state stronger, and the people that work together make them stronger, that they, they, uh, they, they have these great opportunities to get something done. The Pueblo of Acoma adopted its water quality standards in 1998. They were approved by EPA in 2001. So far, the Pueblo of Acoma has faced a handful of compliance problems from dischargers, and on each occasion, was successful in upholding its standards. When the EPA approves tribal or state water quality standards, the approval does not include any enforcement authority. But under your own laws and regulations, tribes and states may have the authority to take enforcement action. We have phone calls that come in from non, even our non-Indian neighbors uh, to report things that are going on out there that might affect either water resources or our environment. So I think that's that's really the key to management and the key to enforcement is having an open door policy. The Pueblo of Acoma's water quality standards are working. Not only can they be used to protect against future degradation of resources, but they are helping to meet the original goal of improving the health of the Rio San Jose. And now when we go out to the river, we see how the river is coming back. So it's been very successful. Acoma Pueblo has been a leader in protecting our water sources. It's really important that our children carry on these responsibilities. We still have a long ways to go, and we still have a lot of educating to do. 
But the progress that we're making is we've got a water office now. I think it's really important that we begin to show the outside world that we have the management capabilities, that we have uh, the capability to go and monitor our own natural resources. As a tribe, you want to keep it healthy. You want to, you want to be able to have a, a clean river, you know, so the fish will be able to come back. For centuries, Chehalis people lived along the Chehalis River near the western coast of what is now Washington State. The Chehalis tribe depended heavily on fish from the river. In the 1860s, the Chehalis were moved to a reservation between the Black and Chehalis Rivers. Today, most Chehalis are employed either by the tribal government or in the gaming industry. In the late 1980s, the quality of the Black and Chehalis rivers began deteriorating. In the low times of the river, we could walk across the river, but then in our, I say maybe 20 years ago, we would cross the river and it was slippery. The rocks were all coated and slippery, and we said, man, there's something going on here. When it makes a change that you haven't seen before, you know, a bank changes and there's no more trees there, or the, the river's never been this color this time of the year. A lot of our problems have happened because next to the river, there's a lot of logging going on, construction, and there's mudslides. And in 1985, we had a, what they call a fish kill. Biologists are hauling hundreds of salmon out of the Black and Chehalis rivers south of Olympia, many of them trophy-sized. Oh, about a 35, 40 pounder here. More than 200,000 fish died from toxic pollutants released into the water. When we saw fish kills, it was kind of a wake-up call. We said we need to not only not let it deteriorate, but somehow enhance the quality of the water. How are we going to do it? The Confederated Tribes of the Chehalis Reservation first started an environmental program with a grant from the EPA. The tribe opened its water resource department and set up a water quality laboratory in 1992. The laboratory staff began testing the surface and groundwater on the reservation. We test the water because that's uh, where the fish live and many people on this reservation use fish as a big part of their diet. So if the water is contaminated, then possibly the fish may be contaminated and we want to find that out before it gets too bad. Okay, temperature 8.53. Specific connectivity is 0 0.05. And the depth is 0 0.7. We have money that comes from, from uh, uh, the Environmental Protection Agency to our tribes, and we go out and test the water. The state don't. We do it. The tribes do it with our professional infrastructure. We're able to go and ask ourselves what's going on rather than asking somebody else and not knowing if the answer that we're getting is is one that we're being told to just pacify us or it's, it's a, an actual answer that we can rely on. So having your own department and your own entity that you can ask and is certified and has the training and background as necessary makes the answers that you get mean that much more. In 1994, the Chehalis tribe began the process of developing their water quality standards. The tribe wanted to become a more substantial player in actions that might occur both on and off reservation that would affect their waters. And they knew the way to get to the table to be that active voice in, in decisions that were made was to have their own laws and regulations establishing what they felt were important for protection of their waters. Washington State's attitude is, let's make this work. It hasn't been uh, to fight about jurisdiction. We have felt that Clean water is a benefit to all of us. Sediment will be washed uh, into the uh, river causing... Uh, the tribe's natural resources department started holding meetings to inform tribal members and to obtain their input. First of all, we looked at what are the state water quality standards are. And we said, are they tough enough? Are these the standards we can live with? Are these standards are good enough to protect what we are trying to protect? And we found out that, yes, the standards they have are what we would like to have. They obviously did not want to compromise any of their goals or standards, but they wanted to make theirs at least in form similar to Washington State's. Knowing that at some time in the future, 
they can refine and tune those standards further to match their reservation waters. It was a more expedient way of getting their standards in place, and as a consequence, they're one of the few tribes that does have standards in place. After the tribal meetings, the Chehalis tribe went to the community at large to share their ideas and plans. I think that's very important because a lot of times the fear people have not knowing what's going on or how is going to impact me. I think tribes need to be very clear and have an open door policy to discuss those matters whether they are tribal members or not. They conducted a hearing, they sent out public notices, they um, engage their community as best they could to get input on their standards before they finalize them. And it was, it was very successful. Then the tribe drafted their water quality standards, which were approved by the EPA in 1997. The most important thing for tribes is it gives us a seat at that table and finding a relationship of government-to-government uh, -government relation uh, to, to work together. Careful planning, open communications, and solid relationships between the community at large, the state of Washington, and the tribal government enabled the process to run smoothly. A few years ago, maybe if one of our community members seen something going happening to the river or being put into the river they weren't comfortable with, they really had no recourse of, well, gosh, look at that, that's not good. Once we develop the water quality standards, it's like antenna has gone up to every tribal member. I get phone calls from people I have never met on the reservation. Even non-Indians call me. We just saw on the Satsup River somebody was dumping this truckload of gravel next to the river. Do you know about it? Somebody they can talk to and say, you know, I've seen this, is this right, or is there something we can do about it? So, so we put one of the remedies kind of in the middle here, and it's not situated in a, some state or county agency. We have established rules, and we have made those rules known to other people, and we're prepared to enforce them. We have laws in the books to punish those people who are trying to discharge into this water or contaminate this water. We don't want the agriculture people to move. We don't want the timber industry to leave. We want them to be there. We want them to do the right thing. And uh, there's a right way to cut timber and there's a wrong way. There's a right way to take care of the watershed and there's a wrong way. In 2001, the tribe and state signed an agreement to establish a partnership in which both parties committed to early notification on water quality issues, sharing information, and consulting before actions are taken. Through this agreement, the tribe and the state have coordinated management of the water resources in the Black and Chehalis watersheds. They help to form the Chehalis Watershed Partnership. That's a partnership amongst the governments uh, in this uh, Chehalis watershed. I think it works to the benefit of all. It will minimize disputes that occur, they will benefit from each other's expertise, and they will really work in a cooperative fashion to manage their shared waters. The Chehalis tribe is seeing progress. They put rules in place to protect their life source, the Chehalis River. And they've been cleaned up on account of the government and the states and the tribes, all working together to make it happen. It's working. You know, maybe it'll take a hundred years to clean that up, but it will be cleaned up. And we've started, you know, and, that, and that's the most important thing that we've started. We're not leaving, we're here. We're here and we'll be here a hundred years from now. And we'll be sitting at that table together. By implementing their water quality standards, the Acoma and the Chehalis tribes continue to see positive results. Their rivers are running cleaner and fish and plant life are returning. The tribe's waters will be protected for generations to come. Both tribes saw their water quality deteriorating and took positive steps to improve water quality by developing and implementing water quality standards. And it doesn't matter the size of your reservation, large or small, we all need the protections afforded by water quality standards. We encourage all of the tribes to start the process of adopting standards under the Clean Water Act. 
both the tribal coordinator and the water quality standards coordinator can help the tribe identify sources of money that may be available to help offset the cost of developing standards and implementing them. What we did was very first thing is to look at grants to find money and EPA again came up for money for us. You can buy equipment, you can hire people, you can train people. So how do you get started? Talk to your tribal members so they'll understand the importance of protecting valuable water resources. Their support and involvement is critical. If you have a tribal member working in the water quality program, you have more at stake because your family lives here, your children are growing up here, they are using this water, this river. I would involve all other concerned people, anybody that has a concern for the health of their rivers, lakes, springs, and streams to uh, do whatever they can to protect that resource before it's too late. Contact EPA's regional office in your area. EPA staff is available to provide technical assistance and advice. EPA stands ready to work with tribes on developing standards. The process of developing standards won't be easy in all places, but it's very, very important. <laughs> Our water is our future. By protecting our rivers, lakes, and streams today, we protect a vital life force for future generations. EPA is committed to working with tribes on a government-to-government -government basis, with states, with federal agencies, to protect Indian country waters. I cannot really overemphasize how important is it is that this is the time and opportunity for the tribes to develop their water quality standards. Being able to say, I have the capability, my people, my tribe has the capability to run this type of program. It's our river and it's our water and, and if we don't do it then we can't expect somebody else to do it for us. It's our water at this point, but it's the water for my grandsons, for my granddaughters. So it is that time that we need to really start focusing on those people that are behind us, that are yet unborn. We can find a way to make things happen if we're talking together. When the rain sings and we don't know what it means, we hear the rhythm of bare feet dancing and we can't figure it out. It's the last drop of a refreshing drink from the spring of continuance and all that is left is but a drop of remembering. Some, Some say, say the spring will fill again from the depths of Mother Earth and we will be full.